The manhunt for an escaped juvenile murder suspect comes to an end. And on campus, a public forum with university police leaves students disappointed. Those stories and our pet of the week, coming up on Carolina News Today. The runaway 13-year-old murder suspect who escaped custody Tuesday after a hearing in Lumberton is back in custody. The boy apparently ran away from the Department of Social Services building by slipping out of a leg restraint. The search was a coordinated effort with local and county police, State Bureau of Investigation, and U.S. Marshals. The minor and a 19-year-old man are charged with the shooting deaths of two men in a Lumberton mobile home in October. He allegedly spent Tuesday night in the woods and Wednesday turned himself in after stopping at his uncle's house. His mother said she tried numerous times to get assistance for her son and his behaviors. Telling the social workers and the mental health workers and social services that that's what your problem is and you calling them every day, then that's something that should have been done a long time ago. During the search, police released the minor's first name and photo because he could be considered dangerous. The U.S. Marshal Service of the Carolinas was offering a $1,500 reward for information leading to the boy's capture. Pembroke Town Council this week voted against a rezoning proposal that would have allowed construction of a low-income apartment complex near Highway 711 and Judy Road. The Planning Commission had not recommended the change from residential to multi-family dwelling. Council members questioned the developer's representative about the number of units, types of tenants, the rent, and security plans. Some were concerned about, its, about that it would end up as student housing, but the project's federal incentives allow only certain kinds of tenants. Some on the council and neighbors in the area expressed concerns about traffic, pedestrians, flooding, and changes to the character of the neighborhood. Pembroke Town Council also voted to support a grant application with matching funds of at least $1 million. Town Manager Tyler Thomas says an expansion project at the wastewater treatment plant would cost about $6.7 million, but federal funds are available from the Department of Commerce. The town had to agree to put up 20 percent. The project would increase capacity to 2 million gallons per day. Right now, the plant treats about a million gallons of wastewater per day on average. The state of North Carolina prohibits running these kinds of plants at more than 80 percent capacity, but the town is still growing and should be prepared, according to Thomas. In Tuesday's elections, Pembroke Mayor Greg Cummings won another four-year term, defeating former town councilman Alan Dial. In Laurenburg, controversial Mayor Matthew Block was running for city council where he felt he would accomplish more, but was defeated by incumbent Mary Jo Adams. Block's term as mayor is now up, and the, op and the office goes to Jim Willis, the owner of Shirt Tales, who pleaded no contest to assault charges back in February regarding a fist fight with Mayor Block, who was filming while Shirt Tales was on fire. At the Police and Public Safety Forum hosted by SGA this past Tuesday, the student body had the chance to voice their frustrations after pepper spray was dispersed into a crowd of tailgaters before the homecoming football game. Officer Marcinski was positive the forum was insightful and productive for both students and campus police. Uh, there was a few times uh, the crowd was maybe wasn't pleased with some of the answers that we had, uh, especially when they spoke on the, the incident that happened at tailgating. But people want to have to realize there's human resources issues involved with this. So we can't just go out and tell everyone what happened. I personally don't even know what happened. I know the officer has been dismissed, but I don't know the background of it. But we need to take that negative feedback and learn from it. Uh, I think overall, yes, it was good. There was a few moments that you observed, you know, some people uh, blasted out certain comments, but that's to be expected of anything of this setting. After the forum, despite the lack of information, at least one student leader said he hoped the forum could lead to lasting results. I'm optimistic that something will be done. Um, so hopefully my optimism uh, isn't met with uh, harsh reality, but, but I do believe that, that we are making steps in the right direction. Um, and sometimes a lot of people react and respond out of, you know, emotion, uh, just because, you know, there's so much that they, you know, want to say. There's so many feelings that, uh, you know, they want to articulate. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, they might not come across uh, in, you know, the most professional way, but uh, this is a forum and this is, you know, a place for students to actually, you know, let uh, these people know how they're feeling. Um, and I think it was good for campus police to really gauge how the students are feeling, you know, firsthand. The man accused of shooting a deputy in a Fayetteville emergency room has died from his injuries. Authorities say a deputy and the suspect were at Cape Fear Medical Center Wednesday morning after his Tuesday night arrest. At some point, the suspect grabbed the deputy's gun and opened fire. A police officer was already at the hospital investigating a different case and shot the suspect, 31-year-old Trevor Smotherman. He died at the hospital. Sheriff deputy was also shot. Um, he's, he's, been, he's okay right now. And just to reiterate, um, there was a scuffle that occurred. We're in, a, in an investigation, so we are unable to give you any further details until the investigation proceeds regarding the scuffle. And then we also have called SBI. They're going to do the officer-involved shooting investigation portion of this. Um, for right now, we want to be able to um, let you know the scene is safe and secure. Presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren spoke in Greensboro Thursday and plugged her proposed wealth tax on the super rich to help fund higher education. In her appearance at Harrison Auditorium on the campus of North Carolina A&T, she pledged $50 billion in federal support of historically black colleges and universities. She also recorded a podcast with political commentator Angela Rye. In Robinson County, the Humane Society has reached its capacity for cats and dogs. They are hoping someone will find it in their heart to give this lovable pooch a home. It's our Pet of the Week. Hi, I'm with Marcus Locklear, the Assistant Director of the Robinson County Humane Society, and we're here to talk about some adult dogs. Marcus, who do we have today? We're going to be talking about Mr. Oliver today. He's up for an adoption. He's a male yellow lab. He's approximately 60 pounds. Um, we found him on an uh, abandoned highway. Uh, he is heartworm positive. He's up to date on all his vaccines. Um, his application fee is $50 if anybody wants to adopt him. Um, he'll do very, very well with dogs his size. He's very energetic. Uh, he would do very good in a loving home with a big play yard, uh, a lot of attention. Um, he's very, very hesitant at first, but once you get to know him, he'll come around and he's just bunches and bunches of joy. Where can people go to find out more about how to adopt Oliver? You can visit our website at Robinson County Humane Society. Um, you can uh, visit our Facebook page at uh, Robinson County Humane Society. You can see all our pictures of all our babies, or you can find us at Pet Finder, and you'll see some of our pictures of our babies. For Carolina News Today, I'm Caria Pinckney. A second bear attack is reported in the North Carolina mountains. And retailers gear up for holiday shopping. The White House Christmas tree starts its journey in the southwestern United States. We'll be back after these messages. A North Carolina teacher charged with having sex with a student was found dead inside her home Wednesday. Police are calling it a murder-suicide after finding her husband dead, too. Officers responded to the couple's Huntersville home after 59-year-old Michael Ogle didn't show up for work. A relative told police Emma Ogle was inside holding a gun. A SWAT team was called and a nearby elementary school was placed on, on lockdown. But once investigators entered the, the home, they found the couple dead. It's a very unfortunate situation. Um, it's not, you know, it's not a very common thing that we see here in Huntersville. Um, so when it happens, it, it's it's shocking. Um, but our our detectives are doing everything they can. People in a North Carolina community are on high alert after a second bear attack in less than a week. A man says a mother bear who was with her cub bit him and his dog. Here's their story. 
in this gated community called Mountain Brook outside Spruce Pine, wildlife officials confirmed that a homeowner was bitten by a bear Saturday night. An emergency dispatch reports that the male victim had multiple animal bites from the bear attack that involved a full-sized wild bear. An individual sent me an email and said that he and his dog were attacked in his garage by a, a mother bear with one cub. Neighborhood president Don Abley learned more. He had some puncture wounds, uh, was released from the hospital. The dog had to have some surgery. The community is largely wooded and has about 20 homeowners. Our homeowners association is uh, has sent out an email uh, to the general public uh, in the community. In the community that, that uh, this has happened. Abley says he sees bears occasionally about once a month in the neighborhood and is aware that food can be a motivator. We learned to put the bird feeders away at night because they are hungry. Knowing the attack involved a mother bear, he's familiar with their instincts. I've been around bears my whole life. Uh, you don't want to be around a mother bear. Uh, with cubs. Abley says that the homeowner was released from the hospital and that is the only detail so far that he knows. I sent him an email uh, back that you know if there's anything I could do let me know and I have not heard a word from him. Halloween is over and Thanksgiving is still a few weeks away but there's already a holiday forecast and it's looking very cheerful for retailers. Brick Conway takes a closer look. More jingle at the cash register. A new report shows this year's holiday sales could grow as much as 4.2 percent compared to 2018, reaching a possible high of $730 billion. That's according to the National Retail Federation. And this is a critical time for retailers, with November and December sales accounting for 20 percent of annual sales. So the predicted rise is good news for retailers who saw a small increase of only 2.1 percent last year. The NRF blames 2018's tariffs and the uncertainty over a government shutdown. But this is also good news for job seekers. The NRF expects retailers to hire more than 530,000 temporary workers to help with the high demand this holiday season. Experts credit the rise in holiday sales to job growth and higher wages. And it's not just brick and mortar stores seeing soaring sales. The NRF forecast finds online and other non-store sales are expected to increase as much as 14 percent to nearly $167 billion. For Consumer Watch, I'm Britt Conway. The Retail Federation's holiday forecast looks at several indicators, including employment, wages, and consumer confidence. The figure excludes car dealers, gas stations, and restaurants. Ready or not, or believe it or not, Christmas is right around the corner, and a massive tree in Red River, New Mexico will be at the center of holiday season in Washington, D.C., but it has to travel 1,800 miles first. Francesca Washington reports. <laughs> my, my, it's good to see everybody out here. It's good to see you. Christmas came early in one New Mexico town this year. Red Rivers and a nice little Christmas community, so I think it's very exciting for them. And at the center of it all. And this is, this is the tree that's going to shine up in, in Washington. Of all the trees in the Carson National Forest. This tree has the, 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 the growth from the bottom up and it does have that cone effect. This 60-foot blue spruce is this year's people's tree and will be on display on the west lawn of the U.S. Capitol. It's gorgeous. You almost hate to see it cut down, but it's going to be such a statement and it's going to look so beautiful next to the Capitol. Today, hundreds of people gathered to watch crews cut down the tree. This is something you don't normally get to see. Cuesta Mayor Mark Gallegos did the honors. You don't want to have any snags. You don't want to have any incidents where it's, something gets stuck or your chain gets locked up underneath the tree. Once the tree was cut, it was quickly lifted, then loaded up for a two-week journey to Washington, D.C. This tree is a beacon of light and inspiration and hope. Three drivers will split the 1500 mile trip. This is like a parade. I don't think there's there, there's going to be a lot of showing off like this right here. And the tree will make stops at nearly 30 communities along the way. Oh man, this is, yeah, I mean, it's special. Francesca Washington, KRQE. 
It feels a little too early to be talking about Christmas, doesn't it? It, it does. What about Thanksgiving? You're right. Who doesn't love to stuff their face, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Braves football battles back and forth, then heads into overtime. And the swim team dominates the competition in a dual meet. Ty the Sports Guy tells us all about it after this. You told me not to talk to strangers. You told me not to cross the street without looking both ways. You told me not to touch the stove. You told me not to do drugs. You told me not to drink and drive. You gave me so many messages about how to stay safe. Why didn't you keep me safe by properly storing your gun? My mother was always very familiar with her neighborhood, but one day she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual, and uh, she didn't know whether she should go forward or, or turn, and she wasn't even really sure where she was at. It was very unsettling for her. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, I don't want you to worry or be afraid. I'll be there for you, and we'll figure it out. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water, too. That'll probably help. You were probably going to turn down the radio, too, so you could focus, right? Probably OK isn't OK. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on him. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. That means it could be you, your favorite brother, your other brother. Yes. You, your football buddy, your football buddy. You, your plumber. Breathe right into your foot. Your plumber's masseuse. Yes. You, your dog walker, your cat jogger. With early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. What's going on, Brave Nation? Welcome back to another week of Brave Sports Updates. I'm Ty the Sports Guy. Braves football had a game against Newberry in an overtime thriller. First quarter, after stopping the Newberry offensive drive, they punt the ball to the Braves, who end up fumbling the ball, giving Newberry the possession once again. Only this time, they were able to connect in the middle of the end zone on a 32-yard touchdown pass. Then, Newberry is able to regain possession, then do a fake handoff to one side, then hand the ball to number 21, who takes it up the side of the field for a 60-yard rushing touchdown. Then, UNCP finally scores their first points with a field goal. The score, 14-3 Newberry. The Wolves regain possession and do a reverse handoff, tricking the UNCP defense to go one way in order to score the touchdown. Then, it was UNCP's turn to put on more than just three points on the board and it comes from another kickoff return from Devin Jones, who ran it back 95 yards for a touchdown. This return marks Devin's third return of the year and his fourth kickoff return in his collegiate career. But Newberry said, whatever we can do, they can do as well. And it happened the very next play when UNCP kicked the ball to Newberry and Chance Walker finds a hole in the middle of the field returns at 92 yards for another touchdown. The score was 28 to 10 Newberry. And then UNCP goes on a tear, starting with a Josh Sheridan five yard touchdown catch. And then Josh Jones does a quarterback sneak into the end zone. And this play was followed up by a two point conversion pass to Fahim Diab. The score, 28 to 25 Newberry. After a made field goal by Shea Rogers in the third quarter, the Braves had one more shot to send it into overtime, and they were able to convert on this screen pass for a 25-yard touchdown from McKinley Nelson. 
In overtime, the Braves were able to complete a field goal, but would end up losing the game from a 15-yard touchdown pass, sealing the victory for the Wolves 37-34. Braves football next matchup is against Lenore Ryan this weekend. Wrestling was able to showcase their talents at the Georgia Open this past Saturday and sent up an impressive number with 15 athletes to the podium. With Jonathan Miller, Cliff Owens, and Brandon Shoup each posting impressive runs through their respective weight classes, a total of 21 wrestlers picked up at least one victory on the day, while 17 Braves registered multiple wins. Braves Wrestling will be back on November 10th when they suit up to host a 39th annual Pembroke Classic. UNCP soccer celebrated their senior night as they faced up against Georgia College. In their last matchup, the Braves lost to Francis Marion, so the Braves showed up with a chip on their shoulder. Before receiving a red card in the second period, Alexis Pittman was able to score the only goal recorded in the game at the 23rd minute. Gina Ryan had a stellar performance, despite being one player down, with her 34th career clean sheet as, and is now tied for 25th on the NCAA's all-time list. Ryan's 10 saves also marked the fifth double-digit saves outing of her career. After the game, we talked to head coach Lars Anderson and asked how he felt about this year's graduating seniors. The five uh, uh, ladies that we're graduating this year are just as special as, as any class we've ever had. They're, they're great in the classroom, they're great on the field, they're great character kids, and we're certainly going to miss them, but we hope to extend their senior year uh, a multitude of games uh, beyond this one. Pembroke's swim team took first place at the top of the podium in nine out of ten events when facing against both Pfeiffer and Sweetbriar. The Braves also walked away with a pair of individual event titles from both Megan Hunter and Caitlin Rodriguez Matos. Hunter took top honors in the 200-yard freestyle by more than four seconds and then outpaced four other competitors in the 500-yard freestyle by more than 14 seconds. Rodriguez Matos came away on top in the 50-yard freestyle event and then won the 200-yard individual medley by nearly nine seconds. The swim team will compete again on November 16th when they head to Wilson, North Carolina to go head-to-head -head with both Barton and Hampton, Sydney. Volleyball matched up against visiting Francis Marion. Both teams came to the game on a two-game losing streak, hoping to put a mark in the W column. Francis Marion got double-digit kills from four different players and used a pair of late-set rallies to overcome 23 hitting errors. This effort propelled the Patriots to walk away with the victory over the Braves three sets to one. Shannon Skurd and Raven Oates both led the Braves in kills with 11 in the match. Volleyball's record now falls to 13-18 and 18 as they host three games this weekend, including two Peach Belt foes. Well, that's all the sports I have for you this week. Check back in next week to hear about women's basketball and how cross country finishes at the NCAA Southeast Region Championships. Till then, I'm Ty the Sports Guy. Emmy, Abigail, back to you. Thanks, Ty, and thanks to our viewers. Next week, we'll tell you how Native American Heritage Month is observed on campus. And Monday's a federal holiday. It's Veterans Day. That's right. I'm Emmy Shalua. And I'm Abigail Brown. You've been watching Carolina News Today. We'll see you next week.